Uh, my name is Mwenda. Uh, I'm a data scientist with Microsoft Research. So in a team called Farmbits. So Farmbits is the premier Microsoft agriculture platform. And we're trying to empower people, farmers around the world with innovative solutions in AI and agriculture. So at the moment, I'm the only data scientist. And we use satellite data, sensor data, data from the ground, and what have you, to be able to empower people. So what we've done so far, I'm sorry, I never created slides. So what we've done so far is we've, we're empowering farmers in India, increase their yields by 30%. We've done the same thing in the US. And right now, we are rolling out in Africa. So when, when Alfred asked me to come today to sort of present, I never knew what to do. Uh, so I being a co I'm mostly more of a computer person. I don't speak a lot. So bear with me, eh? Yeah, so I decided, you know what, I, 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 use, I mostly use Python for my day-to-day -day work. Number one, how many are coders here, like Python coders, like you actually write code in Python? You can be a newbie and what have you. Okay, ah, what's up, well, <laughs> and, and how many are participating in the, in the, in the, in the, in the program, the, in the competition, the Zindi competition? I can't see you, yeah? uh, Okay, awesome, that's a good number. Yeah, so, so when Alfred asked me to come today and sort of take guys through the data science process, I didn't know what to do. Initially, I started out with the Mobi ticket data, uh, and then I realized, you know what, it, it would be better if I used another data set and maybe walked you guys through, through it, and then based on that, get to pick a few things in there that you can apply into the actual competition, yeah? So I do want to sort of give you guys a leakage or something like that. I, I, I'll not show you the ML part, because it's just a simple, small part. I'll mostly take you through the, the, the data exploratory part, the EDA, okay? So get, do you know what is, an, what is EDA? EDA? I don't want to hear yes, I just want to see hands up, yeah? Because I want to ask, what is EDA? What's your name? Ruth, Ruth what is EDA? Exploratory Yeah, so what does that mean? Oh, okay, awesome. So yes, so basically we're just, when we do EDA or exploratory data analysis, we're trying to look for patterns, we're trying to look for anomalies, outliers, and what have you, yeah? So one of the most critical parts in the data science process is actually, it's not actually the, the ML part, the writing of the programs. Actually, if you look at a different data, a different codes out there, maybe, maybe be it being Kaggle, GitHub, and what have you, yeah? You realize that the, the prediction part is actually a very, very small part, yeah? The biggest part is usually the, the exploratory data analysis part, yeah? So I'm going to take you through that part. Unfortunately, I was supposed to share this code so that we do it step by step, yeah? But some parts are heavy, so it might take a little bit of time, so I'm not be able to do that, yeah? But, but in case you have a question, ask, yeah? I only have like 45 minutes, yeah? So I'll try and go as fast as I can. But if you feel I'm going too fast, please please tell me to, to slow down, okay? So yeah, the third part is gonna be feature engineering and feature, feature selection. Then after that, we're gonna go to comparing several machine learning algorithms on performance metric, yeah? So in this particular case, in this particular scenario, we were comparing the mean. What is the MIE? We are using it in the Zindi competition. Who said that an I is in the Zindi competition? Who's, 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 yeah? Who, I, I, I saw like 10 hands. Where did the hands go? I want to know what MAE means, yes? Yeah. Mean absolute error. Yes, yes, yes. So, so because this was, a, uh, this was a prediction problem, yeah? We were supposed to do what? Use the mean absolute error. Uh, come up with that, but, uh, use that performance metric to look at different models, okay? So anyway, so let's start. Data cleaning and formatting, yeah? So as usual, you know the, 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 the basic things is number one. We import packages, yeah? So we import NumPy and, and Pandas for, an IFO, for data manipulation. Then after that, we go on to, those are just a bunch of, 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 of importations that make your work easier as a programmer, yeah? But the, the other more important thing is the matplotlib visualization. You're going to be doing a little bit of visualization. Look, think of histograms, box plots, and things like that, okay? Then again, we also use Seaborn for visualization. Now, Seaborn is a really good visualization tool, yeah? But it's built on top of, it's built on top of MATLAB, okay? 
So the first part, okay, now this is where we get to import the data. It's in a folder called energy, and the data is energydata.csv. Yeah? So we start by checking out that data. I could even run, should I run these things? Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, so we come here, we run, then we, we, we know how to run using Anaconda, yeah? The shift enter or the control enter, yeah? Yeah, so, so we import that data and then we check out that data. We realize now this data has, how many, the shape of this data is, it has 11,746 buildings, yeah? And 60 columns, okay? So, and that 60 columns is inclusive of the energy score that you want to do what? We want to predict, okay? So this is the head. The head usually selects like the first, by default selects the first five, yeah? But if you want to select more, you can always, you can always, you can always specify, I want like four maybe, for example, and just run it. Yeah, so these are the columns. We see you have property ID, property name, proper parent property, blah, 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 and many blurs, blurs. Yeah, all those blurs, yeah. Just too many. And then this is what we want to try and predict. You see the energy score over here? Yeah? So this is, this is our target. We call it the target variable. Don't we? Is it, or is it the predictor variable? What is it? Is it target variable? Are we sure? Target variable, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a target variable. Awesome. So, so basically, that's, that's, those are, that's, the, that's how the data set looks like. So we have... So now, the second part is, remember the data cleaning part, yeah? We're in the data cleaning part. Now let's start checking for missing values. So what do we do? We do, we, we do run a, a, a code, a, 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 a script, not really a script, because it's not a script, yeah? A line of code, which you call dot .info. So in this case, because our data set is energy data, our data frame is energy data, we just add a dot .info. And, and, and check it, yeah? So when you check, well, so what this code does is it brings all the columns and then tells you, number one, we want to check the data type of these columns, yeah? You realize for prediction purposes, we need data to be either in, we need data to be in numerical, numerical form. So when you have strict, uh, machine learning algorithms do not understand strings, yeah? So when you get to have strings as data types, yeah, what do you do? You change that into, yeah? Sorry? Yes. And how do you do that? It's by transforming them into a, into a categorical, categorical variable. Okay? Categorical variables are numerical in, in nature. Yeah? So now what you're trying to do is, this is just a data set. So basically when you look at this, if you're able to look at the code, you'd realize that a bunch of the columns have now numerical data types. And the reason for that is because we did, when, when, when you have missing values, yeah? When you have missing values, the programs that are used to encode, the program that was used to encode this particular data replaced every missing value with a value called not available, okay? So now not available is a string value, okay? And when you look at the pandas, so what pandas does is the moment it finds a string, a string value, in, its, in, the, in, in the data frame, it converts that particular column, all of it, into, into string, into a data type of, of string, okay? Yeah, so even if, even if you have like a thousand numerical values and then one is a string, the entire data set is, the entire column is converted into a, into a string, yeah? So what we do is, because now when it's a string, you cannot apply ML algorithms and many other data, uh, pandas, pandas analysis, you cannot do pandas analysis when, some, when the values are strings. Especially when a value was initially, when the initial value was, was a numerical value. So what we do is, we take those values, those columns we think need to be numerical in nature and convert them back into, into, a, into, into a numerical data, data type. Okay, do you get me? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yes. Yeah, so this is, what, this is what we do down here. So we take the data and then we say, whenever there's a place that is not available, not available is a value in the data set, yeah? We change it into a not, a number, use the not a number. You've seen not a number, yeah? np.nan, yeah? So now in pandas, it, uh, pandas recognizes np.nan as a, as a, as a numerical value, and it's now easy to actually, to actually now run analysis on, on the data set, yeah? So that is, that is what we do. So we take the data, replace everything that was not available with np.nan, and then we pick 
the columns that we feel are numerical in nature. And there, this is the FT squared, KBTU, metric terms, and all that, yeah? So you realize these are energy terms, yeah? These are energy terms. And that is why another, another very important thing in, in data science is being able to have what we call domain expertise, okay? Because now, if you do not understand what these terms mean, it becomes very hard for you to be able to to actually carry out analysis. So one of the biggest, one of the main things that you're supposed to do once you start solving a particular problem is understanding what that problem is and the different variables inside that data set, yeah? So fortunately, there was a file that was able to help us understand what these different, different, different wordings mean, yeah? So these wordings are supposed to be numerical in nature. So we use that algorithm up, we use this, this code here to transform them back into numerical numerical in nature. And again, I compared it. After that, I sort of checked again to make sure that everything checked out. But unfortunately, you cannot see because again, the, the resolution, and I'm sorry for that. Yeah, so that is what is happening here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that whatever was string in nature has been transformed into a numerical column, okay? So you're able to now carry out uh, the data analysis process. So we go down, go down, then we do what, after that now we do what we call summary statistics. We'd like to understand the different, how different columns uh, trans, 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 translate into, into different summary statistics. And you're looking at, summary statistics you're looking at mean, median, uh, the interquartile ranges, the upper quarter range, the lower quarter range. The upper is 75%, the lower is what? And the interquartile range is usually between between 75 and 25, yeah? So how do you get that range? You must subtract the upper quartile and the lower, and the lower quartile, okay? Uh, so so the, that is what such, uh, summary statistics mean, yeah? So when you look again, let's just go down, it's easier to see. So now that we've changed, now that we've changed the difference, what we've now done, we've changed the difference, the different, uh, we've changed the columns to correct data types, okay? So once you are done with that, now we start looking for missing values, yeah? And then the, the role here is, the rule of thumb that I have used, that we tend to use, is anything, anything that is above 50%, the data set has like 50% of missing values, we drop that data set, yeah? Because the impact of it on the ML model is not gonna be that big, yeah? But if it's lower than 50%, you look for ways of handling the missing, missing values. And what are the ways of handling missing values? Guys, what are the ways of handling missing values apart from dropping the columns or the rows? I have fill with mean, mode, median. Competition, guys, see, well, what is happening? These are the things that you're going to do. Actually, the reason that's why I picked this data set is because it relates very, very well with the Mobi ticket data set, yeah? And the Uber, and the Uber data set. You can actually, you can actually pick out what is here and just feed in the data set from Mobi ticket and you're going to get results. So it's very important that you understand how, how things actually work step by step. So again, he's told me about the mean, the median. She's told me about the mean. He's told me about the median and the mode. What other way can you, can you solve for the missing values? And it's okay to Google, by the way. Exactly, forward fill or back fill, yeah? Are you in the competition? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so basically that is what you're trying to do. So what we're trying to do here is make sure if everything is, so what we did is we got rid of columns that had over 50% of missing values, yeah? Because the idea was, and when you do experimentation, this is what you get to see, the idea was there was not, the impact was not too big, yeah? After 50%, the impact of removing those columns isn't big in, the, in terms of getting the prediction, the, the results, yeah? So that is what we did here. So the first part is we took the total uh, missing values and then we calculated the percentage. We wanted to see for each column how many percentage of missing values are there, yeah? And this is what we get here. So we have like, remember we have like 60 columns, yeah? So for every column, we, we realize yeah, there's some, there's, some, there's some columns that have like 99.9% missing values, yeah? Are we together? 
99.9% of missing values. So basically, we are looking for a place whereby we can get at least 50% of missing values, yeah? And we realize that anything above 39.2%, the metered area or area waters, we just get rid of them, yeah? Are, we to get, are you getting me? Because this means 99.9 .9 of the entire data set is not, doesn't have the, 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 the data, okay? So using our own rule of thumb, we got rid of anything above 39.2%. So all these, all, these, all, the, all these columns, you just got rid of them, okay? So these are, the, the good thing about this function, it helps you understand, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not part of pandas or anything, it's a custom function. It helps you understand, compare different columns and the number of missing values, which is very important. And it also makes it very, very easy, especially when you have a large number of features, like now 60 features, going through them, going through all of them will take a lot of time, yeah? So once you've done that, these other parties now we take, you now get rid of all that. Now you see, for us using the rule of thumb, anything above 50%, we just, just get rid of it, yeah? We drop it, yeah? So now, we've removed how many columns? 11 columns, and now you're left with 46. Out of 60, you're now left with 46 columns, yeah? That's another way of, of, of feature engineering, yeah? Then it's, very, then it's very basic, very basic form. So you've dropped the columns, and then what I did is I took the same, I created the same table again to make sure that they're not actually not in the, in the data set, yeah? And now you realize, yeah, then number 12 is now at the top, at the top is 39% of missing, of missing columns, yeah? Which is really good. So now we can move on. We can move on to, now that's the shape. Now we have, we still have 11,746 rows and we have 49 columns. Now we move on now to the exploratory data analysis part. That part that we've just, we've just taken care of was the data cleaning and formatting, yeah? We've removed the missing, the missing values. We've, we've sort of compressed the data set a little bit, which is really good for, for the ML algorithms and for further analysis. So now the second part, remember in the, in the, in the machine learning pipeline, yeah? We had data, data cleaning and formatting. What was the second part? The second part was? And the third part? Sorry? Awesome, yeah, I, I, love, hey, I love this. There's some people who are listening, which is really good. And some, other, some others are really, really yawning, eh? <laughs> yeah, so now we move to the exploratory data analysis part. Now, the first part is we want to understand the targets, the target column. I'll call them the columns, yeah? Or the target variable, yeah? We want to understand it. How does it relate to other, other features out there, other columns, yeah? Remember, our target column was the energy, the energy score, yeah? We want to predict the energy score of every building. You remember that part, yeah? So for simplicity purposes, we just change this into, into a score, yeah? It's hard typing energy score every other time, yeah? So we change that, and then we start now. The first part is now we want to see. We want to see. This, this is called a, we, we call, this is a histogram, yeah? And it's a univariate, univariate sort of a, a plot, univariate plot, yeah? So we're just trying to see how the score varies for different, for different buildings, yeah? So we take 11,000 buildings and check their scores. And we realize, and oh, by the way, these scores are self-reported scores by the business owners and the business managers. The building owners are building managers, yeah? So we realize that, yeah, the pattern isn't too, isn't too bad, yeah? Where you have some very extreme cases at the 100% and at the 0%. Now, so that says, yeah, number one, either we have some very, very honest people who are, who are willing to rate their building at 0%, and maybe this other guy looks like a Kenyan politician, eh? <laughs> Who says they've done work and they've not done anything at 100%, yeah? So can we investigate this guy a little bit? It's not part of, it's not the main work, yeah? But it's an interesting, it's an interesting observation, yeah? Let's check this guy, see if he's actually, if, if he does what he says he's doing at 100%. That's really high. So, so what we do is now we check, we check, we check, uh, so this other part is still a histogram of, let me just read this, it's energy use intensity. So energy use intensity, how you calculate that is you take, look, think of this as a building, this room that we, have, that we are in, yeah? So you take the total energy consumption in this building, and then you divide it, you divide it by 
the square foot, yeah? So remember the first part, this part was self-reported, okay? This first part was self-reported. So I could say my energy efficiency in my building is at 98%, yeah? But is it really 98%? So we calculated this, because this one you cannot, you cannot cheat, yeah? If you meet a number, if your KPLC meet a number says you've used 100 units, you've used 100 units of electric, electricity. So we took that and divided it by the square foot and realized there's a, there's a very high negative skew. Yeah? Just one. I mean, there's just one. One. Only. And again, remember that other dude who had said he had 100%? Remember that guy who had 100%? Could he be the one who was who lied, he said that he's very efficient, but he's not actually efficient at all. So again, what do we do? So what we call this is an outlier, yeah? This is a very huge outlier, and we have to deal with this outlier. We cannot just let it stay there. So we take, we check the, so we take that particular, that particular column, and study that particular column. We do what we call the description, again, the summary statistics of that particular column. We see, yes, it has 11,000 uh, data points in it, yeah, you check the mean. Again, look at the standard deviation. Look at the mean and the standard deviation. Do you see how huge it is? Like you have a mean of 280, but the standard deviation is huge. Like 8,607, yeah? Yeah, and then, yeah, so we checked all that. And then we dropped, we dropped all the zero values, all the non, the, yes, the zero values using the drop this. You see this, this, this car, what do you call them? I'm forgetting. Yeah, yeah remind me, guys, I'm forgetting this thing. What is it called? What is it called? Uh -huh. What is it called? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a constructor? Do we even have constructors in, in Python anyway? Is it? Is it a method? Is it a function? Is there a difference between function and methods? Yeah, I wanna hear those, those guys talking. I don't wanna hear the mamas, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, so, 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 so we use, so we use this method, we call this method to, so, to remove all the, the, the zero values and then sort them and then take the top, the top five values, yeah? So I took the top five values, these are the least, uh, the ones at the bottom of the pile, the ones are towards the zero, and then we took the tail values. Now these are the highest, these are the highest values, and you realize, yeah, that the difference between seven and 8068 is, is huge, like almost seven times, seven times, six times bigger, yeah? So this is a case of, we need to be able to, so this is what is causing the outlier, and this one needs to be studied a little bit more. It's probably, it probably could be an, an actual value that was miscoded, or a wrong, a wrong value altogether. So again, what we do is now we use the log function to sort of to pick out this, pick out the, pick out this, 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 this row, yeah? So we use that to pick out the row. And we realize that this guy has a case to answer. Because again, you see his score, his score, his score is 1.0. Remember he had put at 100, yeah? But his score is 1.0. So I'm trying to show you, what I'm basically trying to show you is this, is how you get to investigate different, different situations in your data set, yeah? There's a problem in the data set, how do you get to investigate that? Yeah, you, you, get to, you get to use pandas and basically Python to be able to pick out different things, different variables, and sort of try and investigate them. So what we said is, at the end of it all, this guy, while we're trying to investigate the building owners, we'll first go to this guy and sort of investigate him and see what he's doing, what he's doing. Is he lying? Is he doing some cocaine in that, in that room? Yeah, <laughs> or, or, or is he, does he have a juakali? No, no. Yeah, so that is what we are trying. So that is the part, that's, a, that's the purpose of this particular process. Anyway, we are done with that part, so let's go back to our exploratory data analysis, yeah? So we go down and we, and we say, you know what, yeah, so this work, it was not our main work. We've realized there's some problems, the outliers, it's not our main work, so our main work is really to get, to get rid of the, of the outliers and have a, 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 balanced, a balanced data set, okay? So this is what happens in this particular, that, that is what happens here. So we're trying to remove the, 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 the imbalance, the outliers. And again, the rule of thumb that we like using is, you just take the first, for calculating the, the, the underfit, what is underfitting by the way? Underfitting? Sounds, yeah? 
don't 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 answer <laughs> you're giving you're giving i especially i want this table to to tell me yeah you're so so quiet what is underfitting underfitting what does that what does that word mean to you okay you have a trouser yeah or you have a dress that overfits yeah what does that mean or oh, underfits too tight yeah that means you just for underfitting you're only you're only able to put like one leg in yeah and that is it yeah Overfitting can put like too many people in that, like some two people, your two brothers or sisters in that particular dress. Are we getting the point of the difference of underfitting and overfitting? So underfitting basically means the model is not strong enough to understand the data at hand. That's a very basic explanation, yeah? Don't write that in the exam, you'll fail, eh? But I'm just trying to show you how, what, what, what it means, yeah? And overfitting means that your model is, has learned every single, that it has, Yes, actually, it has sort of sort of uh, understanding the data. It has it is. Oh, I'm trying to get the, the right words, guys. Please help me. What are the right words? What are the right words? Specs guy. Of overfitting. What's your name? Peter. Yes, Peter. What are the right words? Underfitting, overfitting, in a very basic way. So I think for overfitting, this is when the model has. Um, or whatever you're trying to predict has mastered your data set yeah. in such a way that if it's given another random uh, data set with the same variable, it will not be able to estimate the same accuracy. Yes, awesome. And underfitting, I'm going to pick someone now. Huh? I want to pick someone at the very back. The very back. There's, a, there's one with a weird. Yeah, anybody there. What is underfitting? Yes, just, yes, give it, give, yes, yes, him here. Yeah. What is underfitting? Is explained what overfitting is, yeah? So basically, underfitting is the opposite of that. So what is underfitting? <laughs> okay, well, again, what's your name, sorry? Peter. Peter, could you help us with underfitting? I think, I think it's just when the model learns from too little data. Yes. So it does not make a, a meaningful prediction, exactly. so to speak. Exactly. So too much data, too little data, the opposite of it. Yeah? So what you're trying to do here is you're using, you're calculating using the quartiles to, to try and remove the outliers. Yeah? So anything above the upper quartile and anything below the lower quartile, you get rid of it. Okay? So once we do that, you realize, oh wow, something good has happened. The data set now balances, it's, it's, it takes, sort of takes a normal, a normal distribution, yeah? more or less. Yeah? So that means the data set is more or less balanced with a slightly positive, positive skew. Remember the previous one, we had a very huge negative skew and nothing else on this side, yeah? So it's a really good thing. At least now you've been able to handle that part. So what do you do from here? So now <clears throat> a bunch of explanations. Now we start, we start, we start getting now look, looking for relationships between the skull and other variables, yeah? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to look for a correlation between the skull and, and, and other features, yeah? The other 59 features. What that helps with is you want to know what, what features actually get to influence the skull, the target variable, in a big way and which ones do not get to do that, to do that yeah? So the easiest way is using, is using the, the Pearson's correlation coefficient, yeah? So that means is when things are perfectly correlated, it's one, it's a plus one, yeah? Perfectly positively correlated, yeah? And it's perfectly negative correlated, uh, negatively correlated, it's a negative one. What that means is, if, for example, an example, yeah? An increase in temperature causes rain to, a lot of rain, that's perfect correlation. It's an example. I'm not saying that's how that's that's the case, yeah? Yeah? Again, if we say like a decrease an increase in temperatures causes uh, an increase a decrease in traffic, uh, traffic in Nairobi, for example, that's a negative correlate correlation. Are we together? Am I making sense? Yeah, so that is what you're trying to do here. Very simply. So you're trying to check how different variables compare with. With the, with, the, with, the, with the target variable. So the first part is we took the building type. Yeah, so now what we do is now we turn and start now comparing different variables with, with the target target variable. So I just picked three for, for, for just to show you how, they how, how we apply different uh, diagrams to compare them. But ultimately, I'll just show you how to use correlation to be able to do, to be able to do that, yeah? Vis-a-vis -vis 
the building type. So what I did is I took different different buildings. So the green, the, so we have multifamily building, office, hotel, and unrefrigerated warehouses, yeah? And I compared the density. Once you look at this diagram, well, that, what that diagram says is basically a very simple thing. That actually the building type has, a, has there is some correlation between the building type and the, and the skull, yeah? So that means depending on the building type, the score, the energy score gets, gets affected, yeah? Okay, that is what it means. So when you go downwards, I did another one with, uh, with a street name, the street of that particular place. And still, when you look at it, you realize again, still, again, there's a little bit of correlation, but it's not as high as the, as the initial one, yeah? And then the, finally, the third one, this is the third, yeah? So what would happen in a scenario where you have like 40 columns and yeah. we need to know how they correlate to each other? Do we run like for, do we run all of them simultaneously or one or maybe three, three, three or five, five, five? Ah, uh, okay. So, so, the be so the best way to actually do that is by using what, what I said initially, the correlation coefficient. I'm gonna show you, yeah? The reason as to why I, d I picked out one variable, one target, one, one, one feature variable and compared it to the target variable is I wanted to show people how how you're able to graph and able to see the different the different patterns for that particular for for that particular variable vis-a-vis -vis the target the target variable. So what happens is if you want to if you want to to you can if you want to like visualize all of them. So as at now, what I would do is I'll just do it one by one. Okay. Alternative, you can actually have like many of them using Matplotlib. Yeah? There's a way you're able to specify that you want different. You, have, you want like five graphs. Have you tried that? Has anyone tried that in Matplotlib? Yeah. Have you tried that? Yes. Exactly. The subplots. You guys are smart, eh, but you're not talking. Yeah. You started saying sub. What's your name? Gerard. Yeah. Yeah. Subplots. I've been hearing subplots. So you do the sub, the subplots, and have different, different, different graphings. Yeah. But the easiest way, if you just want your work is just to analyze the data and just move on, the easiest way is to do, to do, to come to do to do the correlation coefficient for every for every column. Yeah. So what I did is that that is what I did here. This first part, just took the entire data set and passed it, and just got their correlations with a VD, the target variable, and these are the results. So I took the first ten and the last ten. Yeah. So when you look at this, you realize that they have some, some of them are heavily correlated, negatively correlated. Yeah. So you see sites, anything with EUI, energy use intensity, has a strong correlation. Can you see that? Can you guys see that? EUI, 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 EUI. So again, when you move forward, we're going to realize that this actually means there's some multicollinearity in the, in the mix. Yeah. Do we know what multicollinearity is? Do we? Yeah. Okay, so multicollinearity is when you have two features, yeah? Okay, correlation is when you have a feature variable and a target variable having some, some pattern, yeah? Either positive or negative, yeah? But in the collinearity space, that means you have two features. Two features, yeah? Like for example, now you have, these are features, yeah? So you have like uh, the first two, yeah, having, uh, being very, being very similar, okay? So that, that, all that means, yes, is one feature I can actually describe the other. So ideally, you do not need either of the, you just need one of the two, one of the two features. So for example, if you are comparing, if you wanted to do a prediction using just these two features, yeah, you would, you would realize, ah, these two features have more or less the same, they're related, yeah? They are heavily correlated with each other, isn't it? So we just, you don't need the two of them. So we just chuck one and remain with, with one. Am I making sense? Yeah? I'm making sense to Peter. Am I making sense to the rest of the people in the, the audience? Please ask a question if you do not understand, yeah? Yeah, so that is what happens now. So, so basically what we've done is I'm checking for different, the correlation coef, uh, coefficients for each and every each and every feature variable vis-a-vis, -vis, or each and every column vis-a-vis -vis the target variable, which is a, which is a skull, yeah? So this means the negative ones means they're negatively correlated. So that means when the skull increases, these ones go down, okay? And when they go down, these ones go down, these columns go down, the skull, the skull increases, yeah? 
So for, for, the, for the positive ones, yeah? It basically means when the skull increases, it also increases, yeah? But we have a very peculiar thing. Why, why do we have a one? This means a perfect positive correlation. Why is it the case? This one. Here, the last one. I can't hear this one. I, I don't hear Peter and Raymond speak. I just want to hear what other people are saying. I don't know what's happening. It's weird. It's weird. We've been talking about correlation and all that, positive and negative, yeah? But what's weird is this one is a perfect positive correlation. Why? I don't understand this, 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 this weirdness. Is it, an, is it an outlier? Should you deal with it? Is it an outlier? Yes, exactly. I wanted to see because, ah, uh, yes. You, you, the, the, the guy, the, the earphone and the dashiki hood. I think it has moved, for example, the first thing it's the biasness, whereby you remove those correlations according to my understanding. Then the second thing, you remove all the, let's say the small features that may make, like, it's not, Somehow, in a, in a sense, like, whereby you have data which will, will give you the perfect sense, but in real sense, it's not yeah. that case. Yeah. So, so, yes. So, I'm going to paraphrase that is what, is, yes. So, what's, gonna, what's happening here is really simple, yeah? All these are features, yeah? And there's some relationship with the, with the actual variable, the target variable, yeah? But then, this is the, the target variable that you're looking at, yeah? So when you compare the target variable with itself, ideally, it's supposed to be the same. Am I making sense to you? Am I making sense? So please, if I don't make sense, ask a question. Yeah? So, so what, what has happened here is it's because, it's because yes, we've removed, we've removed everything else. Yeah? So when we compare the skull itself to skull, which are the target variables, they have a perfect correlation because it's one and the same. So not the same thing, okay? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I I, des I described to you what the energy use intensity means. So now what you are doing is once you are done with that, now we've, we've we've seen that there's some there's some relationship between different variables. Yeah. So now we move to the next part, and this other part is what we call normalization. Yeah. Normalization helps with being able to sort of. And again, these are not scientific words that I'm using. It's just more of explanation, yeah? You're sort of trying to compress the data together, yeah? Because especially when you look at some algorithms like KNN, the KNRS neighbors, and SVM, yeah? They are very sensitive to distance between different variables, yeah? So what normally happens is we get to sort of compress them between 0 and 0 and 1, okay? That is what we call normalize, normalization, yeah? In a very vague and basic way. So that is what we're trying to do here. So here for here, we are trying to get, get the log. And the log takes an arbitrarily large number and reduces it to a, very, to a small number that we can, we can work with, yeah? So you are, doing, you are using the log and, and the square root to be able to do, to do that. And then that's, so that's the first part, the, the numerical part. And then for the, for the categorical columns, remember the categorical columns are columns that are mostly in string format, yeah? And because ML algorithms do not understand string, we need to be able to trans transform them into numerical, into numerical format. That is what we do when we talk about cut. That is what we are doing here. So we take, we take the different columns that are in the string format and translate them into, into categorical variables and then one hot encode them. What this means is it creates a tensor. In deep learning, in the deep learning space, we call them tensors that are numerical in nature, and ML algorithms are now able to actually understand them and act on, act on them, yeah? So the categorical variables are being transformed into numerical variables through this, through this process, okay? So that's what we do, and then here, we join, you know, we combine the two data sets. So remember we had two, uh, we, we had a different data set, we had a categorical data set and the numerical data set. So what we do is we now combine those two data sets, and then we find, we find the correlations of those two combined data sets, yeah? 
So that's, a, that's the same, same thing I explained a little bit uh, earlier. We then do the correlations and check if, 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 if there's any effect of, there's any effect of the categorical variable. Remember the, the initial correlation coefficient uh, table did not have categorical variables, yeah? It just had numerical variables. So in this space, you've combined, we've, we've brought in the categorical variables and we want to see if it does increase the performance of, of, the, of the entire modeling process, yeah? So and we realize it doesn't increase as much, yeah? It's an expensive process, it's a type consuming process. When you run that particular process, it takes a little bit of time. But still, it does not, the categorical variables do not, do not, do not, do not increase the, the performance of the, of the model that much, okay? And we're able to know that based on the, on the correlation coefficients, yeah? But for the sake of, but, but because they increase the performance of the model, what do we do? We just leave them, we just leave them there, okay? Because also, the time they take and the speed they take is negligible. Something like that. So, so that, is why that is why you just leave them there. And then again, so once you are done with that, we now start calculating the correlation coefficients of the highest, of the highest call. We want to see how correlated they are between the highest call, the value that had the highest, the highest um, the cor uh, correlation with the target, the target variable. So we do that. And so this diagram we have over here is a diagram of a negatively correlated uh, variables, these are around 0 0.7, negative 0 0.7. That shows, that was the highest value that we had. If you remember the table that I showed you earlier on. So we do that. So once you are done with that, we have already dealt with the, with the, with the we've, we've cleaned the data, we've explored the data, we know what, we know what algorithms influence, well, sorry, what variables influence the target variable the most, and we've shown that there is actually a, a high relationship a very strong relationship between the highest variable and the target, the target variable. So the last phase, before now you go on to the ML part, is picking the, picking the features now in two things. One we call feature engineering and feature, feature selection. So selection basically is you have like 60 columns. What, what columns are the best to use in the, in the model, yeah? And in engineering is basically how to take different, probably you wanna create a new column based on maybe those two highly correlated features there, you probably would like to create another column out of that, another feature out of that. So that is what is called feature engineering. You can go look at the textbook definitions from the internet, yeah? But from a very basic perspective, that is what it, it means, yeah? So here we, so the purpose of feature engineering is we select the, we're selecting numerical variables and combining it with two categorical variables and then doing again, doing the log transformation to reduce the size of the, the, the distance of the data set or the size of the data set, and then when encoding the categorical variables. And then for feature, feature selection, we remove the collinear features. So remember those features that had, that were related to each other, we just get rid of them, yeah? So to reduce the size of the, of the data set. That is what we are doing here. So we create a copy of the data set, here yeah, using the energy data dot. Again, no, once you are done with that process, see again what has happened. We've increased the number of, of columns based on the, on the feature engineering and the feature selection, the feature engineering, the feature engineering phase, yeah? So once you've done that, now you take it through the feature selection part to be able to, to reduce the, the, the features into very accurate, very accurate and very, yes, very accurate features that actually influence the, the target variable. So that is what we are doing here. And then now after that, we plot, we take the highest, we take the, now, okay. I'll give an example now. Now remember how you're saying some, some features are highly correlated, yeah? When you look at this feature here, these are two features that we sort of tried to, we're trying to understand their, their correlation, yeah, with each other. And you realize that on, on, the, on, 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 the, on your i-axis, that's the weather normalization, normalization, yeah, of EUI. And on the x-axis, we have the site UI. So when you look at this, at this graph here, yeah, you realize that these two features are highly, are highly correlated, yeah? So ideally what that means is we do not need these two features in the data set. We just need one, yeah? Because when you have to those two features, they're going, they going to cause what we call overfitting, yeah? Yeah, so we just need one. It improves the performance of the model while removing the, uh, the overfitting, yeah? So that is what we do here. I'm, I'm almost done, actually. You can see the, uh, what do you call this, the scroll? Yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah. 
So this is the part that we remove the collinear features. The, 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 the features that have a very high correlation with each other. We remove them over here. And then once you remove them, you realize now that our columns have reduced from 110 to 65, yeah? So that means every column that was highly related with each other has been removed, and the, the one that has the biggest predictive power has been retained, okay? Yeah, so, so after that, now we now move on to the next process, which is, which, which is, which is splitting the data into a training and, and testing data set. And then another very important part, very critical part in ML, is creating a baseline. You see, we like, we like, we as data scientists and ML engineers, we like this hype of just taking data and running ML algorithms on it, yeah? But the question is this, do you really need ML in each and every situation? Most often than not, you find that that's not the case, okay? So how do we test if a particular problem needs ML? So we create a very basic baseline, yeah? So what we've done, a baseline is very important because what, what that means is if your model performs above the baseline, that means that particular problem needs, needs machine learning, yeah? But if it performs below the baseline, that means you do not need machine learning for that particular, but that particular problem. Your baseline is able to, to effectively handle that. And your baseline could have been, you just guessed it, yeah? You're like, yeah, I know this is gonna happen like this and this and this and, this and, this and that, yeah? So basically that's your baseline, yeah? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to calculate that baseline for this particular data set, yeah? And when you do that, we, just, we, we, we come up with a score for the baseline, which is 66. And uh, what was this again? Don't answer. What was this again? Uh, I always forget it, by the way, which is weird. What? Mean absolute error, yeah? So this is a baseline that we've created now. So what this means is whatever model, so this is around, let's say 25%, because ours was in the percentile. Remember the scholars in the percentile, one to 100%, yeah? So basically that means by doing guesswork, yeah? Just a bunch of guesswork, you're gonna get the number of buildings, the score of buildings, 25% right, okay? Okay? Yes, by doing guesswork, yeah? 24.5, so I've just rounded it off to 25%, yeah? So then, what we're saying is, when we come up with an algorithm, it needs to be able to beat this, to beat this, by this baseline, yeah? And of course, the, the, the lower the, the error for us, the, the better, yeah? Okay, sorry, it gets 24, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the lower the error, the, the better, okay? Okay? Yeah, so, so I think um, I'm, I'm done. So after that, of course, we save the, the scores and what have you because we don't want to keep on going through the entire process again and again and again. So unfortunately, that is where time got me before uh, Alfred came and picked me out of the room. Yeah, but after this, the, the next part is usually the ML part. And it never takes, it takes like around 20 algorithms. What you do is you just take skkit.learn, you, you, you import sk, sk. yes, S yes, sklearn, of course, sklearn.linear regression, dot gradient uh, booster, and what have you, and just take these data sets that you've divided over here, and pass them through the, through the algorithm, yeah, and then check the, you check the, the MAEs, yeah, the mean, absolute error, yeah, and from, it's, it's only that it's not, I'm not yet done, I would have showed you, yeah, and from, from the initial experimentation that I had done, the score is usually a little bit, usually a little bit higher, yeah? So we go all the way to 9.1, 9.1% in the, in the, in the, in the error. And that is mostly with, with the gradient boosting, the boosted machines uh, uh, algorithm, the GBM. The part of ML or not here, yeah, the, the question was, do we need to have ML in every situation, in every problem, yeah? And for us to be able to determine if we need ML in a particular problem or not, one of the first things that we do is create a baseline, okay? So a baseline is, think of a baseline like of, as, as a simple guess, yeah? It's a simple guess. So ideally, what we are saying is, with ML, we need to be able to go beyond that simple, simple guess, yeah? So what we did here is we took this data in. So, so basically what we did here is we just took if you look, we actually did a simple, the median, yeah? The median of the, of the data set, yeah? 
So we just took the median and we assumed, and then we calculated the, the mean absolute error of that median, yeah? So the median was, the median was 66, okay? Yeah? And then we took now the mean absolute error of that median to be, we calculated, is, we calculated it, we calculated it over here, and we got the median to be 24.5. So what that means, that, what that means is this, for our model to be production worthy, it needs to be able to beat the median, that median, the median level. Or in other words, its error needs to be lower than 24.5 percent. Yeah. First, our objective was to predict the energy score of the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Until the end of the the model. Mm -hmm. I've not seen how we have predicted the energy score. Yeah. Yeah. Can yes, you so can explain for us? Yes, sure, sure. No worries. So that is why I said, yeah, this first, I wasn't able to go the entire process, yeah? Time caught up with me, yeah? But what we are doing, what, what I was taking you through in this particular process was the most, what I consider and what we consider at MSR, the one of the most important processes in the data science, the data science pipeline, yeah? Which is getting the data, cleaning that data and formatting that data, and then doing some exploration, seeing how different variables interact with one another, and then finally picking out different different features and creating a baseline, yeah? You realize if you look at how, if you look at Kaggle competition, if you do simple Google searches, yeah, you realize the process of actually running algorithms, yeah, from here, once you have this clean data, well-formatted data, yeah, usually like around 10, 20 lines, yeah, of code, yeah? So you, what you just do is you import uh, some machine learning library, like uh, a scale learn, yeah? and then just feed that data directly into the into the model, yeah. Usually a very simple, a very simplified, a very simplified process. But unfortunately, as I said, uh, time caught up with me when I was trying to to finish up on that, yeah. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up on that particular part, and then I'm going to forward this IPYMB, this 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 notebook to uh, to to Alfred, who can then share it with you. If that is allowed, I don't know if that's allowed, yeah? I don't know if that's allowed, yeah? So that we can now play around with it. I'm gonna put the algorithms down there, the ML algorithms, and I can play around with it, yeah? You can take other data sets and feed into the, into the entire pipeline and see how the results come out, okay? And see what you can actually tweak, tweak and, 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 and what you can change about it, yeah? So again, I'm sorry for not, for not completing the entire process. So basically, there is no appropriate ML. I know, I, know, I know there's some, nowadays people say you can use some of the very good algorithms, uh, random forest, gradient boosted machines, uh, SVM, and actually GBM has been shown to be very, very powerful. GBM, that is a gradient boosted machine, which is an ensemble model of, of decision trees, yeah? Yeah. yeah? And then it's, 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 it's implemented through what we call the gradient, gradient descent, yeah? It has been shown to be very, very powerful. And of course, SVM. In other cases, uh, KNRS neighbors, yeah? But ultimately, what's gonna happen, and, and I'm going to share this thing with you people, yeah? And you can actually go and see, because I'm going to compare, I'm going to compare five algorithms. Five, between five and seven, yeah? Okay, between three and, and seven. Let me not overcommit myself. So I'm gonna do linear regression, I'm gonna do all those other algorithms, and they're going to see how they perform on this particular particular data set. Again, at the end of it, also another very important thing is on the hyperparameter tuning, yeah? Like tuning the, the how big you want that decision tree to be, how many leaves, you'd, how many branches you'd want, have, you'd want it to be. Those are the most important things, yeah? So you might find that some people have said decision trees are not good, but when you tune the hyperparameters in your own way, Find it to have a very high predictive predictive power. So again, there's no right or wrong model. Yeah, it's up to you to experiment and see what fits your data, your data the most. In ML, there are two very important processes that are going to determine the performance of your model. The first one is feature engineering and feature selection. It's very, very key, yeah? When you avoid multicoloniality and overfitting, things like that. And the second thing is now the hyperparameter tuning, yeah? like in decision trees, those, the different branches you have and things like that, yeah? Those are the key things that you get to, to tune. In K nearest neighbors, you are, you are, the hyperparameter is, is your K and things like that, okay? So it basically, it's about those two main things, 
Yeah, but it's all about experimentation, really. Yeah. There was a question here. Yeah. Wanted to know. Uh, how do you how do you choose them the machine algorithm to how do you as in which ML uh -huh. algorithm to use? To use? Yeah. So so as, as as I was saying, yeah, it depends with the type of problem that we have, yeah. In this particular case, we have a prediction problem, yeah. So in a prediction problem, from a very basic perspective here, there are some algorithms that are used for prediction, yeah. One of them being linear regression. The simple linear regression. Yes, we have, we have, we can use SVM, you can use random forest, okay? So basically what, what happens, and that is what I was trying to, to, to say, to say yeah, is the, you see, data science number one is research, yeah? It's research, it's about experimentation. So what you do is, the rule of thumb is start with the simplest algorithms first, yeah? In this case, you start like, for example, it's something like linear, linear regression, yeah? And then you move on to an advanced level of linear regression. Once you see it's not working very well, you move on to something else, like now radio, uh, random forest, SVM, and things like that, yeah? So basically, it's an experimentation process, yeah? You just test a bunch of algorithms and see what works for you. And you're also looking at the trade-offs. Are you looking at the speed vis-a-vis? -vis? Are you looking for something that is fast, but not as, as, as accurate? Are you do, or do you, don't you mind? If you don't mind the speed, yeah? You can get maybe a slow algorithm that is, that is even more that is even more accurate. So what I'm trying to say here is, number one, it will depend on the problem that you have, the time that you have to solve that particular problem, and the computational power that you have for that particular problem. But, but ideally, if you can, it's usually recommended that you test a bunch of algorithms, yeah? And you start with the simplest, with the simplest first. So don't go to random forest and probably you might find that linear regression actually solves, like these more tickets. Okay, another thing, let me tell you another thing, another secret is this, yeah? Linear regression is a very, very powerful algorithm for small data sets, yeah? So if you realize your data set is, is, is less than maybe 10,000, 10,000, around 20,000 and below, and below, the, 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 the data points are maybe 20,000 and below, if you tune your linear regression well, it will actually outperform. Most often than not, it will actually outperform ram random forest, SVM, and all that, yeah? If you wanna, so once you get to around 50,000, 30,000 and above uh, data points, yeah? Then that's when you start thinking of moving to, to other algorithms like random forest and things like that, yeah? But once you realize that you have a data set that has millions of, mil millions of roles and things like that, now you move on to what we call deep learning and using libraries like TensorFlow, CNTK, and things like that, yeah? Cognitive Toolkit, yeah? So don't apply TensorFlow in a problem that has like 10,000 or 20,000. It's okay, you can do, for learning purposes, it's okay. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, you, you can do that, yeah? But you realize that the performance of that model, if you compare those two algorithms, yeah? It's gonna be down. If you use deep learning algorithms on simple data sets, okay?